Hello, everybody. It's my great pleasure to be a speaker at the IMMS Investigation Fair. I was invited by Paula Maikot. Thank you very much, Paula. My name is Mario Chan. I am a research group leader at the Institute of Pathology, the University of Bern in Switzerland. Now let me share my screen. Today, I would like to talk about autophagy in breast cancer and cell viability and motility. Before we start, I would like to give you an overview of autophagy. Autophagy is basically a cell recycling process. It starts with the phagophore, the nucleation and elongation of these double membrane, double membranes leading to the formation of the autophagosome that engulfs the cytoplasmic content. This autophagosome is characteristic for autophagy. The autophagosome can later fuse, for example, with the lysosome, forming the autolysosome. And the content of the autolysosome can be degraded and importantly, can be recycled. So a bit more in detail, the autophagy pathway is characterized by, characterized and regulated by so-called autophagy ATG proteins. We have proteins involved in the initiation of autophagy and the very important negative regulator of autophagy is mTOR, which in inhibits the autophagy initiation complex containing this ULK1, ATG13 and FIB200 proteins. A positive regulator of autophagy is also the nutrient sensor MP. AMP kinase, which can inhibit mTOR. In the second step, we have nucleation and elongation of the phagophore, including here we have the ATG9 protein, the only transmembrane autophagy protein that helps collecting membranes important for forming the autophagosomes. We have proteins here involved in the PI3P formation, which then leads to anchor points for additional proteins. This backlin one complex is also very important. We have additional proteins like the ATG5-7, uh, ATG16, ATG12 proteins that are important for the maturation of the autophagosome. Depicted in the subfigure C here, we see the activation and lipidation of an important autophagy protein, which is also an important autophagy marker, the protein LC3. LC3 is cleaved by ATG4, leading to LC3-1, which is then lipidated and forms the LC3-2 form, which is associated with the autophagosomal membrane. Important to mention is that in mammalian cells, these proteins are also called ATG8 proteins, and there are three families, and um, that might have redundant functions, but we'll focus as a marker here on LC3 proteins. In the next step, we have fusion of the autophagosome with the lysosome, and important proteins here are the RAP and SNAP proteins. The autolysosome is formed. We have uh, certain proteases like cat catepsins that then can degrade the content of the autolysosome. And importantly, this degraded uh, substances can be used as building blocks for additional metabolic processes. For example, autophagy can deliver amino acids important for later protein synthesis. Now, autophagy is a flux process, so it's not so easy to determine autophagic activity. Just measuring autophagy genes is not enough. We have to measure the flux. To this end, here depicted again in a simple way, the formation of the autophagosome and the fusion with the autolysosome. And if we wanna know if we have active flux, we can now block the, the fusion of the 
lysosome with the autophagosome. We can measure this also by looking at or quantifying LC3-2 formation. And when we have block late, when we block autophagy late in autophagy, we see accumulation of autophagosomes because they cannot proceed and LC3B can then later on not be degraded and recycled. Now, if our uh, stress induces additional autophagy flux, we should see an even higher increase of LC3B2 here as compared to the late autophagy inhibition. Here on the right, we have two examples how we can measure LC3, uh, lipidated LC3, either by looking at immunofluorescence and looking at dot formation. Here we have a certain level of autophagy in the control treated cells. Then if we block late autophagy, you can see this huge accumulation of LC3 dots that represent autophagosomes. We can also look at LC3-2 at Western blot because the lipidated form of LC3 runs faster on a Western blot than the LC3-1 form. Now, as mentioned, if we have a stress from outside and we induce autophagic flux, we would have even a higher accumulation of LC3-2 here, and then we can talk about autophagic flux. Now, to breast cancer, and here an example of breast cancer in Switzerland. In Switzerland, one out of nine women are affected by breast cancer within a lifetime. The incidence in Switzerland is 12%, and the mortality rate is 8%. This is pretty much also seen at uh, worldwide numbers. And here you can see that Breast cancer is the most common cancer type among women with about over, with over 2 million cases per year. Here are the numbers of 2020. Um, it's also the cancer or cancer-related deaths in breast cancer are the highest with 15.5% death uh, in 2020 associated with breast cancer. Second is lung cancer in women now due also to increased smoking by women. And as you can see here, the short-term survival rate for breast cancer is rather high with 80%. Unfortunately, there's also relapse and metastasis and there's not, there's a huge issue with long-term survival. And as mentioned, the highest mortality rate is found in breast cancer with 15.5%. There are a variety of treatment options, luckily, for breast cancer, and they depend on the breast cancer subtype and the stage of breast cancer. This involves, the treatment options involve surgery, chemotherapy, radiotherapy, there are targeted therapies, and hormonal therapies. As mentioned, since the therapies also depend on the molecular subtypes, we should have a short look at the molecular subtypes here based on the expression of certain receptors, uh, such as the estrogen receptor, progesterone receptor, and the human epidermal growth factor receptor to short HER2. Based on the expression of these receptors, we can differentiate between luminal A, B, her two enriched and triple negative breast cancers. Luminal A is ER and PR positive and negative for HER2 as a rather good prognosis. The cells are rather epithelial, and we come back to that. Luminal B again is ER, PR positive and shows a certain degree of HER2 positivity. HER2 enriched breast cancers are ER negative, PR negative, and are highly positive for HER2. And you might know HER2 because it can be treated with specific um, reagents targeting HER2. Then we have the fourth molecular subtype that is triple negative. And as the name says, these 
breast cancers are negative for all three receptors. They have the worst prognosis of all of these subtypes, high recurrence rate, and the cells show a more mesenchymal phenotype. I have to say the division in molecular subtypes in breast cancer based on receptor expression is not the only one due to RNA-seq and omics data, there are additional subtypes, but I think for simplicity and still, and because still these um, molecular subtypes based on receptors are still used in the clinic and are still very helpful, I will focus on these subtypes. Now, another important thing is breast cancer stages. So we have stage zero, pre-invasive ductal carcinoma in situ, DCIS. Cancer cells have not yet spread into the breast tissue. At stage one, breast cancer cells have already spread in the neighboring uh, breast tissue. Tumors are below two centimeters in diameters. At stage two, tumors are now bigger, two to five centimeters in diameters. Stage three, Tumors are bigger than five centimeters in diameters, and now the cancer cells have spread to the auxiliary lymph nodes. And stage four is metastatic breast cancer, where breast cancer cells via the bloodstream metastasized mainly to organs such as the brain, lung, liver, and bone. Since metastasis is the main cause of cell death, we, this process is very important. This process of tumor cells or primary tumors and how they can metastasize can be shown, is shown here. So we have a primary tumor and in a process called EMT, epithelial to mesenchymal transition, these more epithelial cells can require characteristics of uh, mesenchymal cells. They can start migrating in the neighboring tissue, either collectively or as single cells, then intervasite into the bloodstream. There they can travel as single cells or often in clusters, also with immune cells. They can then extravasite at a distance site. Sometimes these tumors go into dormancy for years, nothing happens, but later there's a reversion of EMT called MET, mesenchymal to epithelial transition. Tumor grows again and you have a full-blown macrometastasis. Here in a more in a rather simple scheme, epithelial to mesenchymal transition, EMT, epithelial cells depicted here, they're well differentiated, they have intact, intact junctions, they're not motile. And one of the most important markers is e uh, that is highly expressed in these epithelial cells. There are additional markers here. Then during this process of EMT, you also have a hybrid stage where you have epithelial and mesenchymal markers. Before you might reach the complement EMT and mesenchymal cells, these are now poorly differentiated cells with a disintegrated morphology and they show single cell dissemination. So there are no intact junctions anymore. There are several known mesenchymal markers, maybe the most known are vimentin and, and cateterin, uh, but there are also a family of transcription factors that are called the EMT transcription factors, like slux, nail, twist, and sep one and two that are often induced. Now, my talk was entitled autophagy, and now what is possibly the role of autophagy in breast cancer development or therapy. Let's start on the top left. So it has been shown that autophagy can support cancer stem cells. Therefore, it can support tumor growth and can be involved in therapy resistance. It has been shown that autophagy is also important for memory 
carcinogenesis and tumor growth. And in an early stage in normal breast and normal breast cells, healthy cells have a ink, have a high basal autophagy that helps housekeeping the cells, that keeps the cells healthy. And often, if there's a first defect in autophagy, this can contribute to tumor genesis. So early in tumor development, defective autophagy supports tumor growth. We will come back to this later, but also autophagy is involved in tumor dissemination. So that's why we talked also about EMT. But there are different reports. There are reports that show that autophagy limits metastasis, for example, by supporting the degradation of this EMT transcription factor, snail, slug, and twist. Other reports show that autophagy supports metastasis, for example, here by um, increasing the turnover of focal adhesions and e adhering. Autophagy is also involved in tumor dormancy. Importantly, autophagy is involved in therapy outcome and therapy resistance uh, upon different treatments, anti-cancer treatments that are stressed to the cancer cells. Cancer cells can often induce protective autophagy and thus contribute to therapy resistance. Generally, autophagy is also involved in normal memory development. Now, my lab is interested in this protein called cyclin D binding MUP like transcription factor one, short DMTF1. And I have to start at the mRNA level, and you will see why later. So here we have the pre mRNA just depicted exon A to 11. We have uh, splicing, and here the full length splicing, normal splicing. So exon 8, 9, 10 are spliced together. We have later translation into a full DMT1 alpha protein. As a transcription fact, it contains uh, transactivation domains, N terminal and C terminal. We have a cyclin D binding domain, and we have a MUP like domain that's important for DNA binding. Now, I discovered about 20 years ago that there's alternative splicing of DMT1 beta that leads to the insertions of part of intron 9, depicted here. And this insert leads to a frame shift and a premature stop. So that means that we have only translation of a shorter protein. So the N-terminal transactivation domain, the cyclin D binding domain, and parts of the MUP-like domain are identical to the full-length protein. But we also have a better specific protein domain here. So we and others found the following. So the, in green, the DMTF1 alpha, the full length protein transcription factor, is a tumor suppressor, mainly by activating p 40 nrf which is a positive regulator of P53. P53 is a known tumor suppressor that can, among others, activate apoptosis and cell cycle arrest. It has been shown in DMT1 null mice that they can develop uh, certain memory carcinomas late in life. And it was suggested by these findings that DMT1 alpha is a tumor suppressor also in breast cancer. As mentioned, we identified DM displacer and DMT1 beta. We found that DMT1 beta by binding to DMT1 alpha and forming heterodimers can reduce its transcriptional activity, thus we have less activation of the P53 pathway. But we also found that there are DMT1 alpha independent functions of beta that and beta can directly inhibit the P53 pathway. Uh, Another group has shown that DMT1 beta expression is associated with breast cancer in a mouse model, where they engineered a mouse model that 
uh, expresses DMT fun beta in um, in normal in breast in breast cells, and these mice develop uh, breast cancer. So, based on these findings, we also postulate that DMT one beta is an oncogene in breast cancer. But so far, we don't know how DMT one beta can act as an oncogene in breast cancer, and it's very important to know the mechanism that we might can come up with certain new therapeutic options in breast cancer. So to understand how DMD fund beta might act as an oncogene, we use the following two cell line models. So we used MCF7 breast cancer cells. They are luminal, rather epithelial-like cells. And we found that they have low expression of DMT fund beta. And we knocked out, we used CRISPR-Cas9 technology to knock out all DMT1 isoforms in these cells, and then we put back DMT1 beta. Unfortunately, there are not yet very good DMT1 beta antibodies, but you just have to believe me. So here are the parental cells, and this band here is DMT1 beta. We have also lots of unspecific bands up here. Then in the knockout cells, this band disappears. If we put back DMT1 beta, we have again expression of beta. Here as a positive controls, we used 293 T cells where we expressed alpha and beta plasmids. So this allows us to differentiate the size of uh, beta here more specifically. The second model we used are MDAMB231 cells. They are triple negative breast cancer cells. They are mesenchymal, more stem cell like. The strategy here was a little bit different because these cells express quite high levels of DMT1 beta. And we were able to uh, generate and design shRNA that specifically target DMT1 beta by targeting this beta specific region and did not target DMT1 alpha. At the Western blood level, here the control cells, we have DMT1 alpha and DMT1 beta expression. DMT1, DMT1 alpha expression does not decrease when we express DMT1 beta specific SHRNAs, but we have about 40 to 45% reduction of DMT1 beta in these cells. Now, what did we look at next in these cells? So as mentioned earlier, we ecadherin is an EMT marker. ecadherin is a marker for epithelial features. And we thus measured, among other factors, ecadherin in these cells. So on top, again, the MCF7 cells, control cells, we have a certain level of uh, ecadherin mRNA in this case. We knock out all DMT1 isoforms, which already leads to increased ecadherin expression. So these cells are more epithelial-like, already indicating that even the low levels of DMT1 beta and these parental cells might have an effect on EMT. But most importantly, if we put back DMT1 beta, we have a marked and significant decrease in ecaterin, indicating that these cells are now more mesenchymal and are undergoing EMT. Now, the opposite experiment, we used the mesenchymal 231 cells and knocked down DMT1 beta specifically. Here, the control cells, we have a certain level of e expression. If we knock down beta, we have a significant increase in e indicating that we were able to reverse EMT to a certain degree in these more mesenchymal cells. So we also measured other markers, and they support our findings with e -caterine. But these are 
just markers how can we uh, measure in a more uh, experimental way that emt occurred uh, one way is to look at the migratory potential of these cells we used a wound healing assay so you let your cells grow to confluency you in you um, make a wound into these cells and you measure how fast these cells are able to close the wound the scratch again we used the uh, live cell imaging and measured the size of the wound every second hour these are the mcf7 cells i introduced before the control cells show a certain level of migratory potential here in black if we knock out the mtf1 all of them as you can see we have a reduction of migration which is now parallel to the uh, decrease in e cadherin expression and more importantly if we put back the mt1 beta you can see that we are able to rescue here in blue the migratory potential of the knockout cells an important point to mention here is that the effects we see here when we put back dmt1 beta are independent of dmt1 alpha because we have a complete knockout and D cells do not express DMT1 alpha. We also did um, transfer invasion assays to measure the invasive potential of the breast cancer cells. Just shortly, you have an insert here, you put matrix gel here, which is part of extracellular matrix component. You can seed your cells on top of matrix gel. Below, you have a membrane with a certain size of the pores, and you put a medium with an attractant below. What you then measure is how these cells invade the matter gel and migrate through the pore, and you can determine the number of cells that made it to the other side of the membrane. And this is what is quantified here as percent the percent invaded cells here to control cells as expected the knockout cells show slightly reduced slightly but significantly reduced invasion potential if we put back the empty fund beta these mcf cells show a significant increase in the, in their invasive potential we did the opposite experiment as before with these MDA MV231 cells, where we knocked down the MT1 beta specifically. Here, the wound healing, you can already see these cells. If you look at the time scale, migrate much faster than MCF7 cells. If we knock down beta with two different SHRNAs, you can see that we have a clear and significant reduction of wound healing potential. The same is found in the transfer invasion assay. Here, the control cells, these cells migrate in a few hours through the or, um, matter gel and through the membrane. And if we knock down the MT1 beta, we have a significant reduction in this invasive potential. We also did an in vivo experiment using zebrafish xenograft where you inject your labeled cells in red into the duct of cuvier and what you measure then is how many of your cells can actually extravasate and form these dots in the tail region and i have to mention that for this essay we used not breast cancer cells because the model has been established for a prostate cancer cell line but we tested also this very aggressive prostate cancer cells for dmt fun beta expression. They also showed high levels of dmt fun beta. And we also showed when we knocked down dmt fun beta in these cells, we have reduced um, 
wound healing and invasion. And using this model that is quite similar to the 231 cells, we found that knocking down DMT1 beta specifically leads to a significant reduction of metastatic foci formation, also depicted here in the embryos. Now, we found that TMT1 beta is involved in uh, breast cancer cell migration, invasion, but we still didn't know how. How can TMT1 beta cause increased cellular migration and invasion? We thought maybe one way to find out is to find to check if there's a specific interactome that of proteins that only interact with the DMT1 beta domain that maybe would lead us to a, a hypothesis or pathway that can be affected by DMT1 beta. To this end, we used the following flag tagged construct. So here, uh, a vector that expresses DMT1 beta containing this beta specific domain. And we used another construct that is identical but lacks the beta specific domain. We checked for binding partners by pulling down DMT1 beta using a flag antibody magnetic beads and then did mass spec analysis. The same was done for this domain lacking DMT1 beta, uh, for this construct lacking the DMT1 beta specific domain. And the idea was by comparing the two interactomes and subtracting this interactome from this interactome, we might be able to identify a better specific interactome. Here, just a Venn diagram of the pull down proteins. So we pulled down a total of about 350 proteins with the delta MHR construct and about 560 with the DMT1 beta construct. 240 of the proteins were common and both pull downs, which is not surprising as they are identical here at the end terminus, but we were very lucky because there's a large amount of proteins that are specifically binding to the DMT1 beta domain. Now, using a first gene ontology analysis of these DMT1 beta interacting proteins, we were quite intrigued by the fact that we saw several processes that, or yeah, several indication that autophagy pathways are involved um, with proteins that bind to the DMT1 beta specific domain. Here, you can see that our key autophagy proteins like ULK1, YPI, ATG13, that are highly bound to the DMT1 beta construct, but not to the control or the construct lacking DMT1 beta. We also found several mitochondrial proteins specifically binding to DMT1 beta. Now we know why I introduced autophagy at the beginning, and it's getting even better because we also did RNA-seq analysis of the um, of breast cancer cells with high expression of DMT1 beta, where we knocked down DMT1 using our SHRNAs and the gene ontology analysis of the RNA data also indicated lots of pathways that are associated with autophagy here in green and pathways related to migratory potential. If you look at the hierarchical clustering in the knockdown cells, we have reduced expression of these key autophagy genes like BPS34, UK1, WIPA1, which are much higher expressed in the control cells. We verified these uh, expression levels uh, with qPCR. Here, just two examples for WIPI1 and GIK3C3, which is uh, VPS34. The control cells show a certain amount of expression 
And if we knock down the undefined beta, we have a significant reduction of expression of these autophagy genes. So now we are back to this scheme and our data indicate that DMTF1 beta induces increased migration and our omics data and pull down data indicate that DMTF1 beta is associated with autophagy. So in the next step, we had to check is autophagy indeed affected by DMTF1 beta expression. Here again, our MCF7 model where we knocked out all DMT1 isoforms and rescued with DMT1 beta. Here on the left, we determined autophagic flux by LC3B vessel. As you might remember, LC3B is an indicator of autophagosomal formation, and we have to block late autophagy to be able to determine the flux. And you can compare the control to the knockout. And if you quantify several of these Western blots, you can see that we found there's a significant decrease in autophagic flux if we knock out all the MD1 isoforms. But most importantly, if we put back the MD1 beta, we have a significant increase in autophagic flux. This is also shown here, this time not by Western blotting, but by immunofluorescence, here the control treated cells, the buffalomycin treated cells. And I think you can appreciate here, compared to here, that we have much more LC3 dots, which indicate autophagosomes. The quantification is shown here on top. Um, control a certain amount of autophagic, autophagic flux, which is significantly reduced in knockout cells and can be partially, but significantly rescued by putting back. DMT fund beta. Now, based on this data, and we had much more uh, experiments indicating the same uh, in the mesenchymal 231 cells when we knocked down DMT1 beta, we had reduced autophagic flux, so the opposite experiment. But based on this data, we thought, okay, can we? reduce the migratory and invasive potential of our breast cancer cells by blocking autophagy. So we used, again, the wound healing assay, and we used a late autophagy inhibitor, bafilomycin, and an early autophagy inhibitor, inhibitor VPS34 inhibitor 1. Just let me guide you through these slides. So we have to control MCF7 cells, the knockout cells and the DMT1 beta rescued cells. In black, you see the wound healing rate of the control treated cells. So we have a certain base level of migration here. As shown before, knocking out all DMT1 isoforms reduces the migratory potential of these cells and putting back DMT1 beta rescues this phenotype. Now, treating with the bafilomycin, the late autophagy inhibitor did show a certain level of inhibition, but this inhibition of wound healing was not significant and was clearly not changing the migratory potential of DMT1 beta rescued cells. Now, what is very interesting is that using an early autophagy inhibitor, we could already inhibit uh, migration of the parental MCF7 cells. There was no effect on the DMT4 knockout cells, but we could also significantly inhibit the DMT4 beta induced migratory potential. We were so intrigued and so surprised by this data that we repeated the same experiment using two different or two additional autophagy inhibitors. A late one is hydro hydroxychloroquine. You might know chloroquine uh, as a treatment for malaria, but it's also a, among, it's a, among others a late autophagy inhibitor. And we used 
And early autophagy inhibited that inhibits the kinase activity of UOK1. Again, the basal migration of is shown in black with con and control treatment with DMSO. DMT1 knockout reduces this potential and putting back DMT1 beta rescues the migratory potential. And similar to the data with bafilomycin, the late inhibitor hydroxychloroquine cannot inhibit the migratory potential of these MCF7 cells, but the early autophagy inhibitor can significantly inhibit the migratory potential of the control cells and most importantly of the DMT1 beta rescue cells. So in general, we found that late autophagy inhibition does not affect the migratory potential of our breast cancer cells and that early that inhibition of early autophagy reduces the migratory potential of our breast cancer cells. We also validated these findings by genetically blocking early autophagy by targeting UOK1 and BPS34 with SHRNAs or late autophagy by targeting a protein that is involved in the fusion of the autophagosome with the lysosome. And we only found reduced um, migration when we knocked down ULK1 and BPS34 and not LAMP2 at the late stage of autophagy. Thus, we found that the DMT fund beta oncogene is activating migration of breast cancer cells. And our data indicate that this activation of um, increased migratory potential of breast cancer cells depends on autophagy because DMT1 beta induces autophagic flux. It induces expression of early autophagy genes like ULK1, VPS34, and YPI1. We also found that it interacts with early autophagy genes like ULK1 and AGG13. And importantly, we found that inhibition of early autophagy also inhibits DMT1 beta induced migration. We are now a step closer to understand how DMT1 beta acts as a non gene in breast cancer by supporting EMT migration via autophagy. We still need to identify if how exactly DMT1 beta induces autophagy. Is it by direct bending to autophagy proteins and somehow activating them, relocalizing them, or is it by transactivation, by transcriptional activation of autophagy genes by using parts of a still existing um, activation domain, or does it block negative regulators of autophagy, uh, such as uh, members of the, of the TFAP pathway? This we still don't know, and this is ongoing research. So I'd like to close my talk with coming back to autophagy and cancer therapy and zooming out a bit and showing you what is known so far. So anti-cancer therapy in general could also lead to excessive autophagy, which then could lead to autophagy-mediated cell deaths in cancer cells. In this scenario, you would like to combine your anti-cancer therapy with autophagy inducers, and there are certain reagents that can actually induce autophagy, either specifically or less specifically, and in combination with anti-cancer therapy can promote increased cell death. But said, having said this, this scenario is rather rarely or is rarely found. What is more commonly found and is this scenario here. And as I mentioned at the beginning, autophagy is a recycling process, providing 
uh, energy and building blocks for uh, other um, pathways. And it's often in, or mostly induced upon stress. And most or all anti-cancer therapies, chemotherapies, targeted therapies induce, of course, stress in cancer cells. These cancer cells are often able to activate autophagy. And in this case, it's a protective autophagy, which then contributes to chemoresistance. In this scenario, you would rather combine your anti-cancer therapy with autophagy inhibitors. And this is also what is now being tested in lots of different clinical trials. One problem there is that they are not specific yet very specific autophagy inhibitors and that it's clearly depending on the tumor type and the stage of tumor if autophagy inhibition can support anti-cancer therapy and now our data show that early autophagy inhibitors like ULK1 and VP34 inhibitor might help to reduce the migratory invasive potential of breast cancer cells. And importantly, also for potential new therapeutic strategies, this is not seen when using other or late autophagy inhibitors. Data I have not shown you in this talk is that DMT4 and beta can also support stem cells or tumor initiating cells and that this might also support that DMT4 and beta might also contribute to um, breast cancer pathogenesis by supporting cancer stem cells. Now I would like to thank my team who did of course all the work and all the data I showed you are, were generated by Nicola and Igor, both finished their PhD. And the DMD Fun Beta Breast Cancer Autophagy projects are now continued by Shun and Yi. I also have great collaborations at the University of Bern with the Mariana Krut of the Julio with zebrafish experiments, with Ramin that helps a lot with bioinformatics. I have a very long-standing collaboration with the Scripps Research Institute, with the Bruce Torbett's lab, that helps me a lot with all antiviral work. Proteomics data were done together with Jörn Dengel at the University of Fribourg in Bern. And we started a very fruitful collaboration recently with Paula Maikot, and we are now working together on this role of autophagy in cancer cell migration and i'm looking forward to this collaboration here are the funding bodies that supported my research and i would like to thank you for listening to my talk and i hope you learned a bit about autophagy and its role in breast cancer and about this oncogenic variant dmt fun beta and how it can contribute to breast cancer. Thank you very much.